Uh, mein Name ist Stefan Schumacher und ich bin einer der regulären Sprecher hier bei DeepSack. Und um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I started to work with computers in 1987 with this beautiful East German small computer with 1.7 megahertz and a data set drive, meaning all the computer programs were stored on this uh, cassette drive. Uh, I'm also one of the editors of the this year's DeepSec uh, proceedings called the DeepSec Chronicles Volume 1. Together with Vene, I produced the book. I was the guy responsible for all the technical stuff. So uh, the PDF file for the printing service was produced by me, and you can get the book uh, at the reception desk. And we hope to produce much more or many more uh, proceedings for the future upcoming conferences. Um, my research goes into social engineering and security awareness. I taught uh, a two-day workshop here about social engineering. That's why my voice is still a little bit affected by it. But we also do research in the field of psychology of security, meaning we do um, try to develop a didactics of security and cryptography. We do qualitative research about the construction of security in individuals. How do people create their concept of security? Why are they not affected, for example, by the Snowden leaks and other stuff? And uh, currently we are doing um, programs in Germany with several government authorities and, and uh, other um, offices about IT security in very small enterprises, meaning we, we talk about businesses that don't even have IT staff, they don't even have system administrators, and how are they supposed to do IT security? And um, that's where our data privacy laws come into play. Um, historically, the debate about data privacy and data processing started in the 1950s, 1960s, when computers became powerful and affordable. Um, governments wanted to collect and analyze data. They wanted to do so in the United States. John F. Kennedy started a program um, which spun off a, a huge debate about data, information, and knowledge as uh, being uh, a method of power. Um, especially in Germany or West Germany, the population was not happy with this uh, uh, development and the scientific and political debate began, which led later to data privacy laws. The first data privacy law worldwide was introduced in the German federal state of Hesse in 1970 and was made into a federal law in West Germany in 1977. Uh, a debate about data privacy did not exist in East Germany because we had slightly different problems with privacy and monitoring. Um, in 1981, every West German federal state had a data privacy law uh, installed and introduced. Um, the Data privacy laws are based on the concept of so-called informational self-determination, which was a concept developed in the German uh, discussion about data and privacy. And uh, I want to cite, uh, cite uh, this text in the context of modern data processing, the protection of the individual against unlimited collection, storage, use and disclosure of his or her personal data is encompassed by the general personal rights of the German constitution. This basic right warrants in this respect the capacity of the individual to determine in principle the disclosure and use of his or her personal data. Limitations to this information of self-determination are allowed only in case of overriding public interest. That means we have um, the, the concept that I can say what or who or what has uh, access to my data, data about my life, my personal information, my name, my address, uh, my, my gender, my sex, my health status and everything else. And it's not only uh, a right, but it's a right according to the German constitution, which means uh, it cannot be cancelled. It is protected by constitutional rights. So, um, to sum it up, what does it mean? Administration or federal offices or government offices and companies are not allowed to gather data about persons or what, about me. Administration and companies are not allowed to process data about me, and they are not allowed to share data with others about me, unless they are legally allowed to, unless a, a, a law is saying they are allowed to do so. For example, when uh, I buy uh, something at an online shop, at a mail order retailer, they are legally allowed to process my address to send me an invoice and to send me the package. Um, or if I agree to it, in written uh, form uh, and with certain limitations. They cannot force me uh, to underwrite uh, an agreement that they are allowed to process my data. For example, when I want to buy stuff, they are not allowed to force me to allow them uh, to use my data for marketing. Uh, that has to be an active opt-in. I have to opt-in and I have the right to not give the uh, allowance to process my data for marketing purposes. Um, 
The main concept of data protection we have in Germany, as defined by the laws, is that um, data processing, data gathering is prohibited um, with the reservation of authorization, which means it is forbidden unless it is allowed by law or by the person affected. Um, we also use the concept of data reduction and data economy. Uh, if you don't need the data, or if you don't need the data, you, don't, uh, you are not allowed to gather it or to process it. Um, the third point is the so-called necessity. If the data is not necessary to fulfill uh, your task, you are not allowed to gather it. For example, you're not allowed to ask me for my birthday if you just want to send me an invoice, because for sending an invoice you don't need the data, or you don't have to know the date of my birthday. Um, the fourth step or point is the so-called appropriation, which means data is only allowed to be processed for the purpose it was collected. So even if a company, for example, uh, a mail order company, uh, knows my address and banking data, they are only allowed to use it for sending me the invoice or sending me the package. They are not allowed to use these data for marketing purposes. Uh, for example, they are not allowed uh, to send me marketing letter, advertisements and other stuff. Uh, or check or do background checks uh, based on my address on the income in this town. Uh, there are a lot of, um, or is it possible to, to assume uh, or make assumptions about my income based on my address. Uh, because there are town parts in town which are cheap, which are more expensive. Parts in town where people with high paying job lives and peop, uh, places where people who are jobless live. And based on this um, address, you could make such an assumption, which they are legally not allowed to do so. Um, there is a quote from uh, Thomas Hobbes, who said, and covenants without this word are but words, and of no strength to secure a man at all, which means there has to be someone with a sword uh, who is unable to supervise uh, this law. And therefore, we have several supervisors in Germany, um, the first and highest ranking is the Federal Data Protection Officer, who is responsible for all the federal agency. So every government agency uh, from the German federal government um, has to be supervised by him or her. Every federal German state also has an own Data Protection Officer, who is responsible for the agencies of the federal state, for example, the, state, the police of the state and not the federal police. But they are also... Uh, the supervisors of companies who have the headquarter in this federal state. Uh, so if your headquarter is in Bavaria, the Bavarian supervisor is responsible for you. If your headquarter is in Berlin, the Berlin supervisor is responsible for you. Um, companies also have to have an internal data protection officer, depending on the number of employees and or type of data process. There's, there are legal limitations. Very small companies usually don't have to have one. Uh, unless they are uh, processing very, very sensitive data, like data with medical information or something like that. Uh, for example, hospitals, uh, phys physicians and other uh, professions have to have um, data protection officers. Um, the supervisor can also uh, shut down and confiscate the IT system of a company that is not obeying the data protection law. So if there's a data leakage or break in this, they can simply go there and get all the IT shut down and take them with them to further examine them. And this usually uh, is um, yeah, actually like a death penalty for a company or for most companies today. You know? if, if the IT is, is confiscated, they can't work anymore. Um, supervisors can give out monetary penalties. It's us usually limited to 50,000 euro in Germany. But um, what's quite interesting and many executives and uh, board members from companies don't know is that the company can get this money back from the board, members of the board or the executives. So if a penalty is given to a company, the management, the board, the ex executives of the company can be forced to pay it from their private uh, income. Um, they don't only uh, supervise companies, but they also offer help. For example, if you have a problem with your IT and you are not sure if there is uh, a problem with data privacy or IT security, you can contact them in advance and ask them to help. They are willing and uh, happy to help uh, companies. Many companies only see them as the guy who comes to punish, but they also are there to help you. Um, there was one incident some years ago where Lidl, the supermarket company, had to pay uh, an amount of 1.46 million of euros um, as a penalty for breaching the data privacy law. Um, it amounts to 1.46 mil million euro because there were several uh, Lidl sub-companies, they are broken down regionally, and um, some of them hired private investigators uh, to uh, look for um, 
theft in uh, in stores and they also monitored uh, the people working there which they were not allowed they uh, installed cameras uh, in the changing rooms and in the toilets and therefore they get a very huge penalty by the uh, data protection officers of their responsive uh, federal country or federal state um, companies who have to have an in-company data privacy officer um, have to uh, have one who checks the data privacy measures of the company. It's his responsible to check all um, the privacy measures and also uh, the IT security measures which with regard to data privacy. The data privacy officer in a company has to report directly to the board and the, or, or the executive depending on the legal form of the company, uh, depending if you are a uh, uh, shareholder company or uh, another form. Um, but interestingly, the Data privacy officer has no power to direct. He can only give uh, his report to the board, and the board has to take the actions. Uh, this also means that the data privacy officer uh, in person um, is not uh, reliable or is not uh, uh, responsible for data leakages and other problems. It's always the problem of the, of the board or the executive managers, the C-level executives. Um, to protect the data privacy officer, he cannot be fired unless there are very severe reasons, like he stole money from the company or other stuff. Unless this happens, he cannot be fired for being a data privacy officer. That's to protect um, the data privacy officers, because they usually uh, want the company to do very unpopular stuff, stuff that costs money, um, that hinders the work of the people working there, or they assume that it hinders them, and other things. Um, according to the law, the data privacy officer has to be reliable and skilled. That's all that the law says. Um, one can debate what uh, reliable and skilled means. Um, skilled in this context means he has to understand IT, he has to understand IT security, he has to understand laws, which can get very, very complicated. I'm working as an external data privacy officer for companies, and we're currently working for hospital, and there are special laws for hospitals because they have very, very sensitive data, and the legalese in these documents can get really, really hard, and you have to understand it, and you have to be become half of a lawyer on your own. You also have to understand the IT, and you have to understand what kind of data uh, is there. Right? So you have to know what uh, all the physici physicians talk about when they use their IT systems. Um, most companies usually use an external consultant because there are companies uh, or people who offer these services, they are trained in it, they know what to do. Uh, bigger companies usually have lawyers and IT security experts working together and uh, it also is usually cheaper because um, the, the, the internal data privacy officer has to be uh, in power for usually three to five years, and that means you cannot fire this employee. Huh? If you use an internal data privacy officer, he's protected for at least three to four years. And that is something many companies don't want, so they rely on external consultants. One of the measures, or one of the things um, the data privacy law, uh, law wants to do companies is the so-called directory of procedures. Huh? It's a directory, it's a paper, which is required if personal data is processed, which usually affects every company. There is no company that does not have personal data, and be it just the banking account information of their own employees. It's personal data, and therefore they do need uh, a data privacy officer and the directory of procedures. Um, this directory is a list of all procedures that process personal data. So you write down every process, every procedure that accesses, uh, that uh, that, um, accesses personal data. For example, this happens usually in the application process. Now, people who, employ, uh, who apply for a job in your company usually send in personal data, the application letters, and they have to be protected. The access has to be limited to these uh, letters. Not everyone in the company has to have access to these letters, only those who are directly involved in the hiring process. Um, personal records of your employees, email can be private if uh, your company members or your employees are allowed to use email personally for personal purposes, then the email is private and is also protected. That means you cannot directly access their email accounts. Uh, another uh, typical uh, topic are disciplinary warning letters. They have to, have, um, they have to be uh, stored in the files, but not everyone has to know about them or not everyone has the right to access them. Um, the directory of procedures is usually uh, parted in two parts. Uh, the first part is the so-called public part, which has to be handed out to anyone who wants one. So if uh, you have a company and you're processing private data, anyone, uh, can, ask, oh, anyone can ask you 
Hat denn Andreas Kabel? Jo. Anyone can ask you uh, to get uh, this uh, directory and all the uh, processes and procedures which, which are written down there. Um, the second part of the uh, directory is the so-called internal part. And this internal part is quite interesting because it is used to describe the security measures uh, and is only meant uh, to be seen by uh, company staff, by IT security uh, people and uh, by the local supervisors. So if the supervisor office comes to your company, they usually demand to see the internal part of the directory of procedures. Yay. <sighs> and um, this is um, the point where IT security directly comes into place. So every thing or every procedure you describe in this, uh, in this directory about IT security is only meant for internal purposes for the company or for the uh, supervisor staff. Um, the directory of procedures is there to describe the process of data processing, um, the involved staff who has access to the data, which usually means you have the uh, board of executives, um, you have the system administrators, you have the person who directly accesses the data. For example, the accountants have access to the banking account data of the employees. Um, the source where the personal data comes from, um, the object of data processing, why do you have this data uh, in your databases, in your files? Why do you need this data? You have to justify that you are allowed to have this data, huh? either by law or by a uh, written permission by those who hold the data. And then you have to give a list of people uh, or organizations that receive this personal data. If there is someone, an external company that uh, receives data, if there are people, uh, external people who receive the data, they have to be listed. This might, for example, be uh, a typical case for federal, for tax offices. They usually do, uh, um, they, they, they work out the taxes for companies and they get this data. And they are allowed to because tax offices also have to have very high standards of data protection and they usually have them. So therefore, you are allowed to give those data out. You're also allowed or required to give this data to the tax officers of the governments because um, they have to calculate the taxes for the employees and such. Uh, this, is, this is demanded by law. Therefore, you are allowed to have this data and give it to these tax offices and federal tax offices. Um, the main questions or the main purpose of the di Director of Procedures is to answer these questions. What data is there in the company? What data do we have? Where does it come from? How did we get that data? Um, is it legally or legally gathered data? Uh, is the data correct? Huh? Every person has the right to demand that incorrect data be corrected at once. Um, who entered illegal or incorrect data? Who is the culprit? Uh, where and how is the data processed? Hmm? Is it internally, externally? Are there external consultants involved, external companies and such? Who has access to the data, which can be quite a complicated uh, question to answer. And are there any external companies involved? If so, are they in the European Union? Are they uh, uh, in other states uh, like the US where um, other data privacy laws are uh, in power? Uh, legally, you are not allowed to give data uh, or to, to send data to companies uh, situated in countries where the data privacy laws are of lesser standard than the German ones. And some of you might have heard that the uh, European Union, uh, or the, what's it called, court, the European Court, uh, said that the safe harbor uh, treaty with the US is not uh, legally binding anymore, which means that we are not allowed to send private data into the US because the data protection standards there are lower than our German ones. Um, the most interesting part uh, in the internal directory of procedures is the so-called uh, technical organizational measures, or TOM, as we abbreviate it. Um, it is required in the internal version, and it is required not to be published. It's not given out. It's just there for your company, for the head of the companies, um, for the system administrators, IT security staff, and, um, of course, for the supervisors if they want to see it, because this is where they check if your data is really protected. And the first part, you only tell them what data you have and where the data is. In this part, you show them, or you have to show them, how you protect this data by encryption, by storing the files in a vault or something else. So it is there to describe all the technical and organizational measures to secure data. But unfortunately, it uses a very different terminology than we use in IT security. Now, we have established terms in IT security. Those are not used in this part because 
uh, it was mostly developed by government officials and lawyers, so it's a lot of legalese terms in there. And it's sometimes really complicated, and I think uh, we could have stuck with the German uh, terms we use there, or the standards we use in IT security. We have a lot of standards in, in this field. Uh, now we have an, uh, a new one or another one, which is a bit different. Um, there is a list given by the law which kind of measures you have to uh, check and list and describe in this document. And these are the physical access control, for example, if the server room is locked, if the offices are locked, uh, if there are special safety or security doors or gateways and other stuff. Um, if document files and paper are locked away or if they are stored on the desks. Uh. Uh, another one is access control, um, which means usually stuff like there are users with passwords. Uh, you have a domain controller, NFS, NIS, or whatever. Uh, you use two-factor authentication with YubiKeys, RSA, chip cards, or whatever you have there. Then you have to speak about the user access control, role-based access uh, control, typically things like access control lists, groups, uh, different groups. For example, the accountants are in one computer group and uh, have access to all the accountant data, which the marketing uh, team usually has not, which is uh, listed here. You're also required to give categories for data. If you have different data, you have to give a category for these data and have to explain who has access to it and who is allowed to access it. Um, you have to give uh, information about your disclosure or transfer control, for example, um, if you have external backups stored in uh, a bank or in a vault or somewhere else, you have to describe how uh, they are checked, how they are secured, for example, by encryption, they are stored in a, uh, in, a, in a vault, in a safe, and are therefore secured, so they cannot be accessed by the person working in the bank. The next point is quite interesting, it's the input control. Uh, it basically answers the question who entered the data and who is responsible for mistakes, who put in wrong data. And the thing is that this input control produces a log file which is itself very sensitive data again. So by setting up a log file who logs, which logs uh, who enters data, you produce another process which creates uh, da uh, personal data which has to be kept private. And it actually means that for this input control lock, you have to have another input control lock and so on. So you end up in a, in a pretty interesting situation. Um, this is also um, very problematic because um, technically you could lock every key pressure or every key uh, hit on a keyboard, which would allow you to uh, supervise or to monitor your, your employees. Uh, you could check if they type uh, fast enough if they make breaks, if they uh, are not working, and this is very, very sensitive data, which is actually uh, a conflict with the idea of data privacy and data protection. So um, we usually, uh, in, in companies, we usually set up a, a list of people who are allowed to access and input data and keep this list, and uh, technical measures are very, very complicated. So um, actually, uh, from a technical point of view, we could use key loggers, but these would be against the law. Um, Another thing is commission control. If you give out data to external uh, processors to, for example, the tax office, you have to legally require them to follow the German data privacy law, BDSG, and they have to obey your orders. So they have basically guarantee you in, in writing um, that they will obey to the data privacy laws and they will not have data leakage, data breaks, and so on. Um, the next step is availability control, which means you have backups, you may have rendered on systems, hot standby systems, UPS, and so on, which is basically just a part of IT security. And the, next, the last step uh, or point is the segregation control, which means data collected for different purposes has to be stored and processed segregated. Uh, for example, uh, you are not allowed to mix up your current clients and potential clients in a database where you cannot tell who is who. Uh, for example, if you send out a newsletter to your clients, uh, you have to have a database uh, for your clients which is segregated from those who are only potential clients or interests. Uh, because you have to tell um, at every time uh, if someone is a client or not. Uh, if, if some potential client becomes a client, you can put him into the next database or into the other database, but you're not allowed to mix them because you at every time have to uh, be able to tell if some data belongs to a client or a potential client which can get also pretty complicated in several uh, smaller companies because many of them put all the data in, in an Outlook or into Word and Excel files and you have absolutely no segregation in there. Um, now let's talk about data privacy and IT security. Um, data privacy and IT security are not the same. 
Uh, when we speak about data security or data privacy, we speak about more than just IT security. Um, they do not cover the same fields, uh, but they are interconnected. Of course, um, data privacy requires IT security. Uh, if you want to protect private data by encrypting, you have to speak about something like GNU-PG or setting up a private key infrastructure or something else. That is typically something we discuss in IT security. So IT security is required if you want to do data privacy. And there we go to the last part of my talk, the small and medium-sized enterprises, which are quite interesting for our work because big companies usually have an IT department and they also have uh, often have IT security people working there. They have dedicated uh, information security officers, IT system administrators who do security, but we uh, work with small, very small and medium-sized enterprises which often do not even have a system administrator. So if there is no one who does IT system administration, there's also no one who does IT security. And we're speaking about companies who have network set up, they don't even know how the network has been set up. Some external consultant has it done 10 years before and they are still running on these Windows Server 2003 on a patch level from 2006. That's what we saw two weeks ago at a, at a customer. So um, it's still there and living. Um, there is a formal definition of what is a small or medium-sized enterprise in the EU. Um, it's typically done by this three cr uh, criteria. The staff headcount has to be less than 250 employees. The turnover has to be less than 50 million. And the balance sheet total has to be less than 43 million. Um, circa 60% of the German workforce work in small and medium-sized enterprises. Now, many people think that most of Germans work for Siemens or Volkswagen or uh, other big companies, but most of our workforce works uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises. And in my home state, uh, Saxony-Anhalt, which is in former East Germany, uh, all the big companies have been killed off in the process of reunification, and about 90% of our companies only have less than 10 employees. So we have... Uh, 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 an economy which is very, very, very small, or consists of very, very small companies. Uh, so we don't have much big companies, and we have the problem of talking to these very, very small companies with 10 and less employees. And you can imagine how many companies with 10 or less employees have system administrators or CISOs or other IT security guys. So the situation is we often have no IT security at small and medium-sized enterprises. There is often, uh, there often even is no IT at all, no IT system administrator, no IT strategy, no IT staff. Uh, IT security awareness is not existing. There is no such thing uh, as security awareness in these companies. Even with all the uh, Snowden papers and debates about open access and heartbleed and such, it is non-existent there. Um, data privacy can be used as a lever to get uh, small, medium enterprises to do something about IT security, and that's what we do. It could be a model for an, uh, for an IT security law. There is currently a debate going on about um, an IT security law in Germany, which only targets huge companies and critical infrastructure. We do nothing about responsibility of uh, manufacturers. Uh, we do nothing about small companies and such. And I hope that we might change this at least a bit. Um, the problem we face is that small enterprises are not interested in IT security. They are often not aware of their role in IT security. Uh, they often say, I'm not, we are not Siemens, we are not Volkswagen, Mercedes, or, or we are not a big company. Why should someone target us? They don't know um, what's going on there. They are often overwhelmed by IT security and sometimes even by IT. Um, there is a lack of skilled labor in very small uh, companies. Uh, if they can't pay much money, uh, IT security experts aren't working for them. And uh, I think the, the money we take per day is uh, sometimes too high for these small companies, so we have to find other solutions. There is no strategy about IT. We cannot motivate them to do something. They are completely ignoring the topic. They are not interested in IT security, or if they are interested, they usually give up pretty, pretty uh, fast. Um, the consequences of security incidents are too far away for them, unfortunately. They cannot imagine what might have happened or what might happen to them in IT security incidents. What they typically say, we did some questionnaires, we did interviews with small enterprises, and they typically say, we are not important, like we are not Siemens, we are not Volkswagen or other big companies, no one want, wants to target us. Um, no one will attack us, we are too unimportant for this. We haven't been attacked in the last 30 years, we had no security incidents. Oh, there were some viruses some years ago, but no other incidents. Uh, they don't even know that they might have had incidents. They don't even know if they're part of a botnet yet. 
or have been part of a, bot of a botnet for the last 10 years. Uh, they don't know what to do. It's what they say in very small companies, uh, we don't know what to do. IT security is too complex for us, which is true from their point of view. They are not IT security experts, they are not even IT persons, so the topic is very, very complex for them, and it's overwhelming for them. Uh, they don't know anything about botnets, script kiddies, Metasploit, and how easy it is to attack them. Uh, setting up Kali Linux and Metasploit is so easy uh, that a lot of attacks are basically done in this uh, fashion. Um, you, we usually show them uh, Sicherheitstaro.eu, which is a German website by Deutsche Telekom. It shows incidents. They, the Telekom has a honeypot network, and um, it's uh, accessible online, and it shows uh, security incidents currently happening in the uh, network of the Deutsche Telekom, which is the largest, largest ISP in Germany. Um, we also use other websites like uh, from Kaspersky or from NORS, which also shows in a nice graphical way that there is something happening uh, and they are seeing the uh, impacts and they are impressed by the graphics. Uh, it's easier to show them some bombs flying around than showing them log files. We also show them log files from our own uh, honeypot network. We've set up a, a small honeypot network with Kippo logs. It's a honeypot for SSH. And uh, some companies, uh, we, ro we rolled it out with some companies, and they were shocked to see that they got attacked. Uh, that someone scanned their IP address range, and someone attacked these Kippo uh, honeypots. We also show them how easy it is to, to crack a password. We show them how easy it is to set up Kali Linux, Metasploit, do a, an untargeted attack. And basically, uh, we did a, um, a training for teachers, and we told those teachers, basically, if your pupil is able to uh, install uh, a pirated computer game and to upgrade a graphics card, he is able to set up Kali Linux and attack your computer. And that's basically the situation we currently have. Um, we show them security incidents that happened in Germany. We have reports given out by the uh, police, uh, by secret services, about incidents that happened uh, also in our a small federal state that is not the industrial powerhouse of Germany, and they are usually shocked to see that even the Russian or Chinese uh, uh, secret services are working there. They attacked our universities, our research uh, labs, and others, uh, other companies. And then they get afraid. They are frightened. And then they give up. That's unfortunately that what happens. Uh, they usually they get afraid, they are shocked, and this state lasts for one or two hours, and then we have lunch or uh, the dinner, and then they get usually fatalistic. There is nothing we can do anyways. It's too expensive. We don't know what to do. Let's give up. Let's ignore the topic. No, let's, yeah, let, don't discuss it. We don't know what to do. It's frightened me, so ignore it. Or they use the paternalistic approach. Usually when they've uh, founded a company in the early 90s after the wall came down and they say, um, I've built up this company and I won't let politicians tell me what to do. That's my company. I'm the head of it. I'm the part of familias and that's my thing here. So they completely ignore um, all the legal approaches to IT security. Um, the countermeasures we have to face or have to find are we have to offer training suited for very small enterprises. There are several trainings available in German in Germany, done, for example, by the BSE, the German um, Information Security Office, government agency, by Bitkom, uh, another uh, uh, club of IT uh, companies. They offer trainings, but they are not suited for very small enterprises. They are, we have to find trainings for people who don't even have an IT. Um, we have to offer standards and procedures for them. Uh, the BSE uh, in Germany offers a catalog for IT security, but it's too big for those small companies. Of course, this catalog has to cover almost every possible situation, therefore it becomes too complex and too big. And the, I think it's four and a half thousand pages at all. Uh, no one in these companies has the time to read it, and not even glance through it to find the, pe the topics that are interesting for them. Um, we personally, I personally developed a, a, a 25 pages guideline for very, very small companies, very small enterprises, uh, which has been printed or is currently in print via the so-called e-business loads. And there's a project by the German uh, Ministry of Economy. Uh, these were, this project was set up 15 years ago to bring e-business into small companies in Germany. So they have the access to very small companies and um, they did all the uh, layout and uh, printed it and they will distribute it to their uh, clients and customers. And we also use the data privacy law as a lever for IT security, to bring in IT security into small companies. Because um, if they don't want to do IT security, we have to force them. And there is no law, there is no other standard or other thing that can force 
companies to do IT security. The data privacy law is the only existing law that can force an enterprise, a business, a company to do IT security, at least at a basic level. And having IT security at least as a basic level is much better than having no IT security at all. Uh, it's not the perfect solution, but it's the best we can currently get, and we have to live with it. Um, they are forced to create the directory of procedures. They often don't know what processes are going on. Having such a directory of procedures is also good for the management, because if you do management, if you do management based on scientific methods, for example, what you learn in business or management studies, you need the list of procedures to know what's going on in your company. Uh, so sometimes they, they, they are just uh, managing by... Uh, yeah, their stomach or, or uh, belly feelings and emotions, and they are not doing uh, organized uh, management. The directory of procedures includes the technical organization and measures, which also leads to an analysis of their procedures and forces them to think about IT security. Uh, they, have to have, they have a checklist. There are checklists produced by, by other companies, by, uh, by the BSI and other uh, offices, uh, the checklists. They, they can use to create their own uh, list of uh, procedures, the directory of procedures, the technical organization and others, and they just have to follow them. And they are pretty, pretty easy to follow. Huh? It's, not, it's not a huge and complicated topic for small companies because they don't have huge and complicated procedures because they are a small company. And that's the only way we can get IT security into these companies and businesses and enterprises. Um, it is really hard to motivate people to do IT security. I know it. I'm a, I'm a psychologist. I studied educational science and psychology. I do research about IT security, psychology of secu security, didactics of security, security awareness. And we know it is very, very hard to motivate people to do something about IT security. It's also hard to motivate people to do something about data privacy. They are not interested in. Even with the Snowden papers and NSA leaks and what else, they are not interested in. Even in East Germany, where we had uh, an all-seeing government agency monitoring each and every one. Uh, even there, the young guys say, I don't care about it, because they don't see consequences, they're not motivated to see them. Um, from a psychological point of view, we would have to find the demands, the demands regarding to IT security. Without regards, without the need of something, you are not motivated to do something. Right? You're only motivated to do something when there is a demand that has to be fulfilled. Unfortunately, it's very, very hard to find these demands. Uh, that's what marketing or market research is about. And a lot of companies put a lot of money into these fields uh, without getting correct answers or valuable answers. Um, once we have found the demands, we should show them how to fulfill them. That's how we motivate people to do something. Uh, and until IT security becomes a demand, we cannot motivate them to fulfill the demand about IT security. Um, of course, as a psychologist, intrinsic motivation is much better than extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation means people are interested in IT security, doing something about IT secure data privacy because they want to do it from the internal system. Extrinsic motivation means we have to, uh, we have to punish them or we have to give them rewards. But if you do so, um, they only do something if we punish them or give out rewards. So we have to constantly be behind them with a whip or with uh, money and punish or uh, reward them. And that doesn't work for a long time, because every reward and every punishment wears out over time. And therefore the motivation, the extrinsic motivation, goes down. So uh, the main question for us is how do we get them to do IT security without forcing them by law, using the data privacy law as a lever, or do other stuff? And that's a question I actually wanted to discuss, but due to the time constraints, uh, yeah, we, we still have some time left. I would like to show the last uh, slide, which are my contact data. Um, it's our website. It's mostly in German. Um, my email address, if you want to contact me, feel free to do so. Just uh, mention in your email that, you, that we met at DeepSec, because I'm at a lot of conferences, and sometimes I don't know where I met someone. Um, we also have an open access journal uh, in German and English. It, uh, it's available uh, via our website. We also have a YouTube channel which is also called Sicherheitsforschung, mostly in German, and uh, some English videos from the DeepSec here, from last DeepSecs. And um, yeah, there are several talks about this. So you can follow me on Twitter if you're interested in my uh, uh, dates, uh, talks I'm planning to give. I'm not posting pictures of my food and my new T-shirt there. It's just about uh, conferences I attend and uh, places where you can meet me. And you can contact me via Xing, the German version of LinkedIn. And if you trust me, you can use this QR code to get the uh, data to your smartphone. Or I will also give out business cards if you're interested in. So um, I'm 
done with my talk. I had to shorten it a little bit, but um, if you want to discuss, I'm there. I will also be here tomorrow. I'll be at the speaker's dinner, and you can contact me via mail or other means of communication. Thank you. And then, since we had such a rough start, uh, I guess we have some time for some questions. So, if somebody has questions for this, and then I have one. Um, are you also uh, studying Austrian law in this regard? And um, absolutely no. I'm completely okay. busy understanding the not, German law. So. Okay, yes. <laughs> and you are not working together with with guys from Austria. To, uh, to, not yet, but yeah. maybe in the future. Interesting. Okay. Questions from the audience? Hi, uh, hi. It's a very simple question. Is there a, a kind of certification about the privacy in German? A certification about being a privacy officer or? No, any kind of. Yes. I, I, uh, I mean, it's in, in law, it's like the. It's the if some uh, some company is to have a uh, very big data about huh? the privacy, in that case, the company have to certificate uh, something um, kind of. Uh, you can get a certification which is offered by private companies, for example, the German TÜV, which also checks the German cars, <laughs> uh, and other um, companies are giving out certificates, but they are they are not. Uh, uh, there, there is no standard set by a law for these certificates. So it's just a private certification from a company which you have to pay for. Which sometimes means that uh, many companies might be interested in selling the certificates and not in actually testing them. Um, there is no legal, uh, legally binding certification required for companies. They have to do what's stated in the law and that's basically their certificate. But some companies who do data privacy uh, or who work as data privacy officers uh, offer such um, a certificate. And you can get um, com uh, computer programs if you are a developer. Uh, we have a customer who develops computer programs and they got their product uh, tested, checked and certified by the uh, so-called Datenschutzzentrum, Data Privacy Center in Kiel, which is uh, a part of the data privacy officer of the federal state of Schleswig-Holstein. But basically, if you have a certificate, you just have a certificate that you pass the test behind the certificate. And there are, of course, also problems as with ISO and other certifications. Um, I actually, I, I have a, a comment, uh, because, and a, co a comment and a question. Um, perhaps first a comment. Uh, you said you wanted to um, discuss what to do. And um, mm. the first thing that, that came to my mind during your talk was, it's, it's basically a matter of, of, of the right product, I think. Don't you agree? Do, do you mean IT security yes. as a product? Yes, IT security as a product, yeah. Mm. I mean, it's not, yes. it's not an easy task to do that, mm. granted, okay? Uh, it's, ah. not, it's, uh, it's, it's not like you, you just pull some rabbit out mm. of the head and say, okay, that's mm. it. You would, have to, you would have to create that product and... and, and of course, you can have an eighty twenty yeah. have, have an eighty twenty um, mm -hmm. approach, and, and basically sell some some basic security. That's that's the first. You can you you can view IT security as a product or create products. There are some companies standing out there doing so. Huh? And, yeah, but um, it's a question of it's a question of is that is that product um, is that product tailored for for those, those really small companies that, mm -hmm. that have. 10 or less employees, I that's, think, that's the question. And not I, think, the, I think the problem is that these products are usually not suitable for these small companies because uh, the margin you can make in this market is too small. They can't even hire uh, a guy with a master's in computer science or an mm -hmm. IT security expert because they are too expensive. And a small company cannot um, buy huge IT security products. That's why, for example, the government gives out guidelines uh, and, and uh, uh, help for these companies because um, they are not relevant in the market of IT security because they don't have the money to be a player in there. Yeah. And the second thing, uh, you mentioned that um, in Germany it's basically not allowed to to process data like I'm living in that district of a, of a city mm -hmm. and that has a result on my statistical creditworthiness and stuff, mm -hmm. right? Yes. 
theoretically. Theoretically, yeah, that's what I'm. Uh, I've, I have been working with Pangs in Germany, and yes. uh, um, I'm pretty sure they're using that stuff in, in, in scorecards. Yes, they are doing so, and we also so, have a, a credit score agency. Uh, or it's not an agency; it's a private company. It's called Schufa. Yeah. Uh, it's basically uh, a company founded by banks uh, who give out uh, loans and they credit a score card for everyone yeah. who applies for uh, a loan. And um, they are usually under fire because no one knows how they calculate the, the score and yeah. um, for not following the data privacy rules. But if you want to get a loan from a bank in Germany, you have to sign, you have to agree that your data has to be or can be sent to this, uh, uh, to this company. Therefore, there is actually Therefore, no it's, way it's to get a loan. You 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 agree. You accept it. Yeah, you have to agree to it. You have mm -hmm. to to accept it, and it's basically a trade-off. You can get a loan without having the Schufa Auskunft, without having this company involved, but then the loan will get much much higher interest.